wonderful grace. The message of grace is brought to you by Christian people who believe the Bible to be the Word of God and who appreciate its power and authority. Within the pages of the Bible itself, there's a God-given design for its study. Rightly dividing the Word of Truth is the key to understanding the Bible. We're glad you've joined us for an interesting look into God's infallible book as Richard Jordan, president of Grace School of the Bible, presents another in a series of messages designed to help you understand and enjoy the Bible. Let's join him now. We're certainly glad you've joined us today. We do trust that our time together in God's Word will be a rich blessing and help to you as we're going to look again at the pages of the Scripture to allow the Spirit of God to teach us through His Word. One of the great exciting books in the Bible to study is the book of Ephesians. I don't know if you've ever read the book of Ephesians. I had the opportunity just recently uh, while I was traveling to uh, share the gospel with a, with a, with a uh, gentleman who uh, we were in the airport in O'Hare, and he was on his way to his home in Naples, Italy. And we had an opportunity to sit for several hours in, uh, uh, in conversation before we both caught our separate flights. And he gave indication that he would trust the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior, made a very clear statement uh, uh, that, he, that he came to understand for sure that he had eternal life, his sins forgiven, simply by faith in Christ, in Christ alone. And it was wonderful to see him pass out of the confusion of religion that had dominated his life and had turned him off from God as a young man to now as someone who really was close to my age, about my age, at uh, the other end of life, and to, to see the, the joy that gripped his heart. And as, I, as we were parting, I said, you know, I'm not going to probably never see you again until we get to heaven. You're going to go the other side of the world. But there's a couple of things I want to do. I had some literature that I wanted to give him. We downloaded off of uh, the, the Internet onto his iPad a, uh, a, a copy of an electronic copy of the Bible. And I told him, I said, you know, when you, as you're going home, you've got like a 13-hour trip. Take the book of Romans and read the book of Romans. And then after you've read the, read the book of Romans, go over and read the book of Ephesians. Now, you can guess why I told him that. Romans is a great foundational doctrine of grace. If you want to understand what the cross is all about and how you and I fit into it, the book of Romans is a book to tell you that. It's Paul's uh, do, uh, epistle written to establish you in the grace of God and all that God is free to do for you through the finished work of Jesus Christ. Then when you go over to the book of Ephesians, you move from how God has equipped you by His grace to live in time and a new identity in Christ for His glory. You move In Ephesians, you move over to the advanced doctrine about why it is that he form, He's forming the body of Christ and what He's going to do with it. And I told him, I said, read, read, read those books and, and then email me back and tell me what you, what you learned. Well, just a little while later, uh, the next day, uh, I, I was going to California, and I was there. He'd gotten back to Naples, and he emailed me. He said, you know, I read the book of Romans, and then I read the book of Ephesians, and I went back and read Ephesians twice because it was a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, Romans a little heavy, but Ephesians, man, it was fun. And I understand that. Uh, I've said to you before on this program that um, as a young teenager, uh, just a young believer, only been saved a couple of years. One of the most life-transforming experiences of, uh, of my Christian life was when I sat down and read the book of Ephesians one day, over and over and over. In fact, I read it 17 times in one day. And somewhere along in the middle of reading that, I got a grip on the book of Ephesians. I grasped it. And then a little later on, the book of Ephesians got a grip on me. And I tell you what, if this little book gets a grip on you, you could never, ever be the same. And I want to just show you how exciting this, this, this little book is. This grand epistle shows right at the beginning the unbelievably explosive joy that this prisoner for Jesus Christ had in Christ. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. That one little verse that opens this book, really contains the whole book in one verse. It's a fascinating verse. I know that most of the time you read over the first verse, you, you've read that, you know, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, of the saints and Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, let, let's get over to the meat in the book. Don't read over these first verses. There's, there, there, there's no circuitous excursion in search of a starting point for Paul. For instantly, we're pointed right to the primary core, the source, and the spring of everything he's going to say. 
Paul. He knew who he was. An apostle, he knew what he was doing. Of Jesus Christ, he knew who he did it for, who he belonged to. By the will of God, he knew how it came about that all this stuff is true. To the saints, which are at Ephesus, and the faithful in Christ Jesus, he knew who his target was, and he knew how every bit of this was brought about. That one little verse, Paul, he's taken apart. Um, that's who I am. Now, if you go back to Acts chapter 19, you'll recall that when, when Paul first shows up in the Bible, that he's not called Paul. He's called Saul. And the reason for that is that uh, Saul was the first king of Israel. Philippians chapter 3, the next book after Ephesians, Paul says this, Though I, I might have confidence in the flesh... I, if any have man thinketh that he have where he to, uh, that he might trust in the flesh, I more. Why? Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Whoa! <laughs> Circumcised the eighth day. My pedigree is authentic. I'm not a proselyte. I'm not a convert. I'm a pure-blooded, eighth-day circumcision. You see, God told Israel in Leviticus chapter 12 that when you had a, had a male child on the eighth day, this is so important that even if it took place, that eighth day was a Sabbath day, you still took him to the temple and you had him circumcised. It's a religious rite. Now, there's a wonderful set of typical teaching involved in that, but the point here isn't the typical teaching, it's the literal doing. And when he says, I'm circumcised the eighth day, he said, I'm a full-blooded, fully credentialed Israeli. Not only that, I'm of the stock of Israel. <laughs> I got the right uh, relationship of the tribe of Benjamin. Benjamin is that most respected tribe in Israel. You remember Joseph? Back in Genesis? when his brothers came to get, get, get food from him in Egypt, when he's ruler over Egypt, after they'd sold him into slavery, he sent them back and he said, when you come back, you can't have anything, any more food, unless you bring Benjamin. And they said, oh, he's daddy's special. He said, well, you can't, have, there's no food for him except, Benjamin was that specially uh, vetted tribe in Israel. A, 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 a Hebrew of the Hebrews. <laughs> Oh, man, Paul had something to boast in. Saul, when his daddy and mama named him, they named him after the first king of Israel. That was his Jewish name. But if you look at Acts chapter 13, verse number 9, then Saul, now notice the parenthesis, who also is called Paul. Now you want to circle that word also. People read that and say, well, here his name is changed to Paul. No, his name isn't changed to Paul. His name always was also Paul. He had two names. He had that Hebrew name where he put all of his confidence in his religious flesh. But he also had the name of Paul. Now, that's the Gentile name. That's the Roman name. You remember Paul told the Roman centurion later on after they put him in jail, he said, I was a freeborn. The Roman soldier said, well, I had to buy my citizenship. Paul said, I was freeborn. He was a citizen of a free city, city of Tarsus. So he literally was two people, a Jew and a Gentile in one person, and he had both names. And when he says, Paul, he said, I know who I am. I know that I've been transformed from that religious self confident, trusting my own ability to perform man to one who has no hope, no trust, nothing in himself, but just in Christ Jesus. Listen to how he says it in Philippians chapter 3. It's fascinating how the Apostle Paul in his epistles will say things that you can go back into the book of Acts and see the history of it and kind of get a glimpse of what's going on. Philippians 3, verse 7, he says, What things were gained to me, all those things that I could have confidence in my flesh for, all the performances that I could beat my chest and say, Look at me, what I've done, all my resources, all my abilities. 
Those I counted loss for Christ. When Paul met, when Saul of Tarsus met the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, he was this religious man with all this religious pedigree, with the ritual and the relationship and the respectability and the, and the religion and the rigor all in line. And yet the reality, he believed in God. He knew there was a God. He knew that he, his people were the people of God. He believed God's Word. But the reality of a personal, intimate relationship, of knowing God, wasn't there. And when Jesus Christ broke into his life in that apprehending way, Paul says in Philippians 3, he says, He apprehended me. The songwriter said, In evil long I took delight, unawed by shame or fear, until a new object caught my sight and stopped my wild career. <laughs> well, Paul got arrested. He got apprehended on the road to Damascus. And he said, When he apprehended me, I counted all the things I ever did loss. Meeting the Lord Jesus Christ took away everything that I had confidence in. And I relied exclusively on Him. And all of my performance went away. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss. You need to notice in Philippians 3, verse 7, verse 7, it says, I counted, past tense. That's Acts 9, road to Damascus. Then it says, Yea, doubtless, I count. That's present tense. I'm still 35 years after the road to Damascus, writing Philippians 3. I always love the way J. Siddle Baxter said it. He said, after 35 years of a Christ-intoxicated life, Paul's one, one desire, his one focus, was that I might know him. Know him more intimately, know him more personally, know him more fully. And he said, I count all things but loss. For the excellency of Christ Jesus my Lord, for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and who count them but dung, that I may win Christ. You see, Paul knew who he was. He knew he wasn't the guy who trusted his own ability. He knew he was this transformed. That's why it says Paul, an apostle. He knew who he was. He was this new creature in Christ, but he also knew what he was doing. He knew what his job was. Paul, that's, what I, that's who I am. An apostle, that's what I do. You go back in Acts 9 and you read it, and Ananias is told by the Lord Jesus Christ, you take Saul and I've chosen him. That's what an apostle is, someone who's chosen. Romans chapter 11, verse 13. Paul says about himself, I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office. Paul understood that Jesus Christ had saved him, not just to keep him out of hell, not just to keep the wrath of God off of him, but he saved him to make him his special spokesman. So he said, you know what, you know what I do? I go out and I represent, I go out and it's Christ in me that's the issue. He talks about standing in the stead of Christ. And God through us, Paul said, that's me. Jesus told his apostles back in Matthew, John 13 rather, he said, whoever receives you, receives me. And whoever rejects you, rejects me. Because you're rejecting the one that sent you. Well, that's, the, that's what an apostle... Paul said, I'm, I'm the apostle of the Gentiles. Let me ask you something. Are you a Gentile? Well, who's the apostle of the Gentiles? Paul. Then who would be your apostle in the Bible? See, that's why Paul's put that right there at the beginning of these epistles. Paul, I'm your spokesman. From who? Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. That's who I do this for. 
I'm the minister of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. If you look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ. Chapter 4, verse 1, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you. Paul knew that what he was doing, who he was, and what he did was for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who I'm serving. That's who I belong to. That's whose purpose and will I'm accomplishing. That's what he would tell the Corinthians, be ye followers of me, even as I am of Christ. That's a weird statement for a man to make who would say in another place, Ephesians chapter 3, unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given. Well, if you're less than the least, down south we'd say you're lower than a snake's belly in a wagon's rut. You're way down there. You're less than the least of all saints. Then he would turn around and say, but follow me as I follow Christ. You see, Paul understood that Jesus Christ gave to him a special message for us, but he knew it wasn't his. That's why he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, what? By the will of God. You see, all of this came about by God's design. It's God's purpose, it's God's will, it's God's design. If you're in Ephesians 1, go back to the book right in front of it, Ephesians chapter 1. I'm sorry, Galatians chapter 1. And notice how, how he talks about it. Galatians chapter 1, verse 11. Paul says, but I certify... By the way, before you do that, go back with me to Galatians 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle. Now watch. Puts a parenthesis. Let me tell you about my apostleship. Not of man. That preposition of means belongs to. It didn't originate as a human idea. Neither by man. In other words, no human instrumentality ordained me to the ministry. They used to say, about preachers said, some are called, some are sent, and some just packed up and went. <laughs> Paul said, no, no human instrumentality, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. You see, Jesus Christ, after his earthly ministry, after he'd been raised, after he'd ascended to heaven, seated at the Father's right hand, the Lord Jesus Christ from heaven's glory is the one who appointed the Apostle Paul as the Apostle Paul. He's the one that intervened, changed Saul to Paul, and by the will of God, by the will of his Father, made him his spokesman. So Galatians 1 verse 11, But I certify you, brethren. Here's Paul's ordination certificate, if you want to say it that way. That the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. Now that's, that's just another repeti repetition of what he said in verse 1. It's not of human origin. Neither, for I neither received it of man. There it is again. Human instrumentality. No, it, no, no, no one came along and said, Paul, this is a good idea. We think you need to do this. I was reading a thing. And the guy was talking about how you need to always be looking around to see young men that maybe you should say, maybe you ought to think about being a preacher. Nobody ever came along to Paul and said, you know, I think you really need to go out and be an apostle of Jesus Christ. Neither was I taught it. In other words, it wasn't there before me for somebody to teach it to me. But by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul gets it directly from the Lord Jesus Christ. Just like the Lord Jesus Christ spent three years teaching the twelve apostles, who were going to sit upon twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel in the kingdom of the liberal, physical, visible, earthly kingdom that Messiah will come back and establish on the earth. So it is that the risen Lord from heaven's glory spent time directly communicating to the Apostle Paul this information. If you look at, hold your hand in Galatians, you look at Ephesians chapter number 3. 
Ephesians chapter 3. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, he's been given to me to send out to you, how that by revelation he, that's Jesus Christ, made known unto me the mystery. You notice that Jesus Christ, by revelation, directly communicated this information to the Apostle Paul. Now that's very unique because you notice what he says in verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. That's what a secret is. Uh, it's something that previously isn't made known, but now is. So he says, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Now you need to look at that verse very carefully because if you want to misunderstand it, you can. Some people say, well, when he says, as it is now revealed, it means it's like to the same degree. In other words, it, it, in previous ages it wasn't revealed to the same degree as it is now. But you know that's not true. That's not accurate. A correct way of reading it. How do you know that? Well, you can read a verse, you can read other verses. When you don't understand a verse, the first thing to do is don't run to another translation or commentary. The thing to do, the first thing to do is look for another verse to explain that verse. So if you look at Romans chapter 16, verse 25, now to him that is able to establish you uh, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began but now it's made manifest. You notice in that verse there's no leeway. There's no previously it was made known to some degree and now to fullest. It just, in that verse, it's previously it was just kept secret. It was not made known. That's an absolute statement. We would say it that way. I could say to you they did not have refrigerators in Abraham Lincoln's day as they do today. Okay? They didn't have diesel outboard motors in George Washington's day when he crossed the Delaware as we have them today. Now, does that mean that they had them back then, but just not to the perfected degree we do today? No. They absolutely didn't have them back there at all. That's a common way of talking. That's what he's saying here. How do I know? Because I can read Romans 16, 25 and Colossians 1, 25. And they, tell me what, what, they tell me about the absolute nature of it. So this is not a statement about it was a little bit revealed then and, 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 and fully now. It wasn't made known at all back then, but it is now. But you notice verse 5 says it's revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets. People say, well, then it wasn't exclusively revealed to Paul. But notice the last three words, by the Spirit. Well, how did Paul get it? Well, verse 2, verse 3 says he got it by direct revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ directly communicates the information to Paul. He goes out and preaches it, and the Spirit of God reveals it through the preaching that's committed to him. He's made an apostle by the will of God. It's a direct issue directly from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now go back to Galatians 1, because I don't want you to miss verse 15 before we run out of time. Galatians 1.15 but when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His grace, to do what? To reveal His Son in me, that I might preach Him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. You see, God's purpose in saving Saul and making him Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, this is who I am, this is what I do, that's who I do it for, and this is how it came about. It's God's will. It was so that he could reveal his Son in me. The preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, the special way God wants you to understand this complete fullness of what he accomplished for you in Jesus Christ. That's the purpose of God. And Paul said, I'm preaching that to the saints and to the faithful which are in Christ Jesus. Everything you're going to read in the book of Ephesians, everything you're ever going to hear from the Apostle Paul, focuses on what God is free to do, what God is accomplishing in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Everything's about Jesus Christ. Everything's about being complete in him. Everything's about being blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Everything's about what God has accomplished through the work of his son at Calvary. And it's offered to you and to me as a free gift. And when you start Ephesians and you read this, and Paul says, this is who I am, and this is what I'm doing, this is who I'm doing it for, and this is how it came about, you see how excited he is about it, because the grace of God has gripped his heart. Can I tell you, you might be in prison today like Paul. Think about it. Paul was in prison when he wrote that. He wasn't sitting on a beach in Tahiti, sipping on my ties and enjoying the, the ocean breeze. You may be in a prison today, maybe an emotional prison, maybe a financial prison, maybe a physical prison. But you can have the liberating power and love of God's grace thrilling your heart as it did Paul's when you see all that God's accomplished for you in his son. And you let that be where your faith rests. You let that be where your confidence rests. You let that be the source of your joy, Christ in you, the hope of glory. You can have mountains of material possessions, financial resources, fame, all the things you think you need to have, and without that, life will be empty. With Christ, no matter what you don't have, life's full. Well, it's time to go. Thanks for being with us today. Till next time, learn nothing.